Hey, all right. We are saving the best for last. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce our next speaker. General Rich Morales has a bio that is longer than my doctoral dissertation uh, because he literally has done so very many impressive, selfless, and heroic things uh, for our country. I will let you peruse this bio uh, to learn more online at, on the website, but here are just some highlights. First, he's a good friend and colleague and an absolutely fantastic guy who actually embodies some of our highest ideals. He was recognized with the Valoris Unit Award, Bronze Stars, and is a Purple Heart recipient. He was an aide to the head of NASA, he serves as professor and head of the Department of Systems Engineering at West Point and just recently retired from the Army and will be professor at Brown University, who we beat in hockey all the time. Uh, he holds degrees in aerospace engineering, a BS from West Point, strategic studies, MA from Naval College and Command and Staff and Resource Strategy, an MS from the National Defense University. He's a Yale MBA, studied system dynamics and organizational learning at MIT, and earned a PhD in engineering because he didn't have enough letters after his name uh, in engineering from Cambridge, a tiny little university in, I think, Germany or something. No. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel Morales served two White Houses under President Bush and President Obama. And uh, Rich, with his truly amazing wife, Christy, and their fantastic son, Matthew, run a home that is literally teeming with cadets who drop in from West Point's campus and people from all over the world for guidance, mentoring, a shoulder, a snack, or a place to rest. Uh, they are the very definition of service to mankind. I could go on and on about this man, but I will stop there and welcome General Ricardo Morales. Hello, friends. Can you hear me okay, Derek? Yes. Great. So first of all, I pay Derek a lot of money to be so kind, and he never disappoints to say all kinds of great things about me. Um, I, I, um, I am thrilled to be here. I'm going to do the very technical share screen uh, for one quick second here, uh, and hopefully uh, we are okay. Uh, and I want to make sure that you can see. Uh, are we okay, Derek? Can you help me with the technical? See presentation. I can see your slides now. Yes. I are can... they just scrolling like an amateur to the very beginning? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, how about now? You're at the beginning. Great. Um, First of all, I, again, it's great to be here. I'm gonna. Uh, I thought about some uh, a clever way to, you know, wrap this around the letter C. So I, I want to give you a little bit of context. Uh, Derek's already given you plenty. Uh, uh, the short version of that intro is that I can't hold a job. Uh, the second is content. Hopefully, that I can talk to you a little bit about what might be interesting to you, and and maybe you can sort of contour to your. Uh, specific disciplinary perspective or your context. And the last thing, which is super beneficial for me, is just a conversation. Derek's going to make sure we don't go over on time. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, really just a, a, a chance for me to chat with you a little bit. And then I'd, I'd love to talk to you about anything that's of interest to you. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead and start if that's okay. Uh, this is what I described, and hopefully you're you're just seeing the screens and not my my notes. Uh, but again, the the context, the content, and then our conversation. Um, the first I'll start with is uh, this context. I want to talk a little bit about me and a little bit about the uh, the military academy, which is you know if you're American and a taxpayer, your military academy. If you're not American, uh, you know you may have one or you may not. Uh, but uh, this is uh, West Point. I'm gonna skip through all of this stuff uh, or maybe just hit the high level highlights, which uh, again, the uh, embarrassing uh, 
maybe seemingly unfocused series of academic experiences I've had. What I tried to do a little bit there is tell you what I got out of them. Uh, I went to the University of Texas at Austin and I was very good at failing out. So I had a hard time uh, focusing because I went from high school where I was, uh, I thought I was a big fish, but it turns out it's very little pond. Uh, that taught me a lot. Uh, and the, the lesson is learning from failure. Uh, the rest Derek has talked about, uh, each of them had have come at different uh, periods of time, given the nature of what this conference is. I know that uh, scholarship and learning is important to you all. So I wanted to share uh, what they are. I take a lot of pictures. So I gratuitously have some Boston Red Sox pics there. My kid at a shuttle launch where my West Point classmate is piloting a space shuttle. So vicariously, that's pretty cool. I claim credit for him, even though I didn't pilot the shuttle. Um, the other is uh, just different leadership experiences. I assure you that even before I understood fully what uh, systems engineering and systems thinking was, I was reaching in that toolkit, uh, most of the time ill-prepared. One of the things that you get to do is you get to arm people with tools and techniques and mindsets that are super helpful. Uh, I didn't get any of these jobs because of how I look. I look like this, right? I got them because of the places that I was able to immerse myself uh, and study and learn from some amazing people. Uh, again, just a snapshot of things that I've done. Uh, Derek covered that very well. A little more uh, relevant to the group, I think, than whatever weird path I took to this Zoom call is uh, these are the things I'm interested in. I, I, I love understanding systems design. Um, underpinning it all, I think, is the theme of what I want to say is this basic, uh, deeper understanding of systems thinking. Uh, it is not uh, a, a throwaway two words up front. Um, Derek uh, and others uh, have done a really good job of uh, making sure that not just my faculty or our faculty, but our students understand the absolute importance of systems thinking. Um, building on that, uh, you know, the science of better, which is how I see systems engineering. I know a thousand people have 2000 definitions of that. And I looked at how you cope create value um, using a systems approach. The way I personally applied this, uh, and, and if I was better, I would have an awesome picture of Derek up there, but I was at a, an appointment a second ago, and I was going to pander. I was going to have all kinds of Cornell stuff up here, and Derek and his uh, much smarter, better half up there, but I did it. These are the different personal uh, clients that I spend time with. Uh, and I don't want to share that, and I'm mindful of the time. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this that you see on this slide. Uh, on that first part of context, I, I said uh, professor and patient. I, I, I wanted to tell you now just, uh, and it shouldn't come up, but it might. Um, I, I most recently had a pretty serious uh, medical problem, and I don't say that to make any of you uncomfortable, but just by way of explaining it's very possible that I will stutter or maybe glitch a little bit. Um, I, I had, uh, in this order, an aneurysm, a stroke, and then I still have a pretty massive blood clot. Um, what is cool about that is that, one, I'm still here, and two, this system's approach at life is actually pretty helpful in how you process contexts like a hospital, like doctors, because uh, I'm not saying that all of us on this call are smarter. I'm not for sure, but it was very useful for me uh, as a patient in a context I don't understand using um, vernacular that I don't understand. I may be married to an awesome uh, nurse, Georgetown Nurse of the Year, uh, but I was pretty scared. And what got me through that uh, is one, A, a desire to make sure that I was here for my 13 year old kid, but do, an understanding that said that perhaps there's a science and it's going to get me out of here. Perhaps this brain surgeon that saved my life like three or four separate times uh, understood and was able to explain to me what was happening. So I apologize for the aside. I, I, I share that only because my vocabulary is a little bit limited and I may need some Derek assist here if my brain overloads. Uh, this is really what I want to talk to you about. And I'm going to transition now to a little bit more context on uh, West Point. 
Uh, we're the nation's uh, first school of engineering. Extremely debatable comment, and I think one of the one of the, one of the better ones. But that's certainly a debatable com comment. Uh, this is my evidence to say that we're not a marching school, right? Uh, at least some people think we're okay. I have a biased view on these rankings. I think they're at times sketchy, depending on how people submit data. But for the most part, uh, other some people think we're doing okay. I think the proof in the pudding is our graduates are prepared to go tackle tough problems. Um, I'm going to switch now to the, the Department of Systems Engineering, which I, I led for five years, and I was a deputy apprentice waiting to become the department chair for another two. Uh, I won't read a slide to you, but this is what we do. Uh, we spend time developing uh, leaders uh, that can solve uh, difficult problems. Uh, you do the same in whatever context you're in. If you're in teaching, if you're a practitioner, you are the leader that solves difficult problems. We have chosen to scope it to those very specific and maybe too lengthy, maybe uh, modeling, simulation, decision science, operations, research, uh, and design. Uh, this is the core of what I wanted to share with you, which is the this contextual understanding. Um, I, I thought it was interesting to share the, the evolution. The department uh, was established in 1989, a pretty good year for red wine and a pretty year for graduating classes at West Point. This is when I graduated. Um, we, we tried to sort of just show where uh, DOD cares about systems thinking and therefore systems engineering. Uh, and we have a nice little uh, uh, probably overly detailed timeline we wanted to show its relevance and frankly show it in a maybe not causal, but if you look at the publications of uh, articles that are more specific to systems, systems thinking, systems engineering, there is an explosion about the time the department was founded. I don't think we were clairvoyant. I think we were lucky, uh, but whatever it is uh, right now, we think we're an extremely relevant uh, part of teaching cadets to think. Uh, the Department of the Army decided to place its largest four-star command, which is in essence like a huge operating unit in Austin, Texas. And when they described their rationale back in 2018, they chose Austin not for um, South by Southwest, but they chose it because of the hub of technology and engineering. Um, you know, this is a World Economic Forum. This is why it's important. I'm going to skip past this. Uh, you all know it's important. You wouldn't be here on a Friday. These are our core competencies. Again, I'm moving a little bit quickly. This is relevant in that I want to talk a little bit about how this department chooses to uh, infuse as a foundation systems thinking to non-engineers, to engineers, to ABED engineers, to people that are going to be astronauts, and people that are going to be poets. Uh, I'm super biased, but I think that it's going to help our graduates become better thinkers and therefore better leaders. Um, we have three majors. I'm going to talk very briefly about them. I'm going to give you um, an example of how we use something we call the, the systems decision making process. I'm going to give you three contexts and I'm going to stop talking in case you have questions. Uh, this is uh, slide soup, but uh, it is the systems design and the systems implementation of the systems V. Uh, systems engineering, uh, you know, again, I'm just making the case that we go all the way from hard systems, which is heavy, heavy uh, computational systems, modeling and simulation. We spent time, at least in DOD, and, and, and we, we tried to give you the full spectrum of uh, really rigorous analysis and support of Joint Special Operations Command on the Iron Man suit, powering it, picking the right materials, to soft SE, and again, not soft and that it doesn't matter, but understanding where, for instance, in this massive, very important continent of Africa, do we spend our time for both strategic means, for humanitarian reasons, and for those things that the Army cares about. Uh, and as a disclaimer, I'm certainly not trying to sell you on anything the Army is offering. I am explaining how, in our particular context, this has been a very powerful tool. Uh, engineering management, again, it's now the implementation of our design, uh, where we create 
plan and execute operations. Again, all anchored on systems thinking. I wanted to share with you what I think is an innovative way to teach cadets that are not interested in being ABIT majors that want to be, sorry, this is the glitch I was talking about. That want to apply systems concepts to management, to social sciences. We had a Rhodes Scholar who could have easily been a hardcore SE major, could have been an OR major, um, didn't want to do that. He wanted to have the flexibility to have another, a double major to study international relations and systems engineering. Because of the ABET requirements, we've created this uh, socio-technical, broader way to apply the coursework and curricular preparation is different. It is much more heavily laden in uh, systems uh, dynamics, in systems thinking, in decision making, uh, and we call this systems and decision sciences. It is my favorite of our three majors. It is not our lead major. It is not our most uh, uh, populated major, but for me, it is my favorite. Not everyone is sure they're going to be an astronaut. And this, we think, uh, gives us a semester abroad opportunities. And I think its creation, and we're not patting ourselves on the back, shows that we are able to practice what we teach because we could have easily just stuck to our two ABET, make your brain bleed majors. This is, uh, I think, super value add. Um, I wanted to very briefly talk to you about the type of research that we do. Our research, like where you uh, work and study and scholar, uh, we think brings in external folks, super important at West Point. And if you didn't know this, for instance, we're not a PhD producing organization. So we don't have, uh, we're not an R1 institution. We do have relationships with great uh, research partners, Ditra, DARPA, uh, you name it, but very different than say uh, Cornell, Princeton, Imperial College, or wherever you may be hanging your hat. Uh, this is our model. We have faculty members that work external. We have cadets that work external. Their projects are scoped uh, differently. Uh, we help the academy, the army, uh, and government. And in Q and A, you know, for uh, context, uh, personally, for instance, I've done army work. Uh, you know, I've worked at, at the White House, at Homeland Security, at NASA. And I can think of a zillion ways why what we teach and prepare cadets to do and what you must do in classrooms and in industry and practice have been relevant. Uh, this is just a long laundry list of people that think we must be okay because they depend on us. 45 opportunities for our cadets. And I, I'm wrapping up. I stole this from Colonel Jim Schreiner, who gave a similar talk uh, with the team of Cabrera uh, disciples that were learning from them. And we just talked about what. Uh, the, I, I left it on here. It's Jim's philosophy. It'd be very easy for me to erase Jim and write Rich's philosophy, but I subscribe to all of it. Relationships are super important. What I love about systems and systems thinking in particular, and the particular brand that uh, the Cabreras uh, support, because it resonates with our cadets. If we're a leader institution, this ability to link people and systems to create an alignment to translate that into improved performance is super important. You can see Jim's insights, they're pretty good, right? This interaction, this assessment of, of risk. We had the Moody CEO on our porch. Uh, Derek said that we have a lot of people at the house. They range from, um, um, I forget her name. Um, uh, anyway, we, we just had the CEO of Moody's talking to cadets and faculty members about the type of work they do, about the work they do with data sets. I think risk is important, but I think understanding this interaction between people and how to you know, properly scope and use things like uh, artificial intelligence uh, are important. The, the idea of a mental model is seminal to what you teach and you have been discussing. And again, I apologize that I didn't listen to the bulk of our uh, conference, but I hope to be able to get uh, the the great insights that you all shared. And then uh, this 
idea of what do we do with data, right? I, I, the history department is talking about data. Uh, I love them, but we're on it. We got data. Um, and then just understanding that part of a system is understanding how it evolves, how you manage change and how you manage uh, using these tools that you all use so well. These are my personal clients. Uh, I added Cornell Engineering. I wouldn't call you a client, but I would call you somebody that has contributed to my development for sure. Uh, I, 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 I'm, these are just cadets. I'm very proud of this moment. I wanted to show you pictures and I'm gonna transition now uh, as I wrap up. Uh, these are our people and we really believe in those four things, right? Which is leadership, getting the right talent and having a diversity of perspective. In our case, culture, background, commission, source, gender. Uh, we just think it makes you more powerful and we're probably certainly not in a minority there. Uh, I, I have uh, all kinds of stuff I could show you, but I'll stop and pause in case you have questions. And Derek, you got to keep me straight on time because I think I'm getting close to when we can go to uh, questions. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I'll tell you a little story. I one uh, there was one time among many that uh, Rich and I had to walk across the West Point campus and. I think it was maybe a five minute walk and it took us probably about 45 minutes because as he goes, he every he basically knows every single person uh, and and he takes photographs as he goes with everybody. And uh, so he's he likes to show photographs and things like that. Uh, it's it's a it's a fun time. So. Um, so, Rich, this is great. It's a great overview of the just huge number of things that your department does and and your history uh, leading up to leading the department. Uh, and I agree with you, it's one of the best departments. I'm probably a little biased too, but uh, one of the best systems engineering departments I've ever seen. And um, you guys do a lot of stuff, a lot of very technical stuff. And I guess I want you to comment on on this quick story. When we first started with with West Point Systems Engineering, it was um, the basic idea was we train these amazing cadets in so many different technical tools of so many different varieties and kinds and projects and all that stuff. But if but if we put a systems tool in the hands of someone who has not been trained in systems thinkers thinking, then you don't get a systems outcome. And so West Point decided to really give a focus on systems thinking and, and teaching DSRP to the cadets. So talk a little bit more about that basic kind of uh, idea um, and how it plays out in your curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. And and I have something on curricular fit. I. I... I tinkered with the computer, so I don't know if you could still see my slides. Can you still see my slides? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the the short of it is exactly right. I think that we have 13 academic departments here. We're a very flat organization. And I would argue that previous to the introduction of the department and the evolution of the department, we were very siloed. We're certainly still siloed. We're not any different than any other university. But um, the idea that we wanted to codify a way, there's many ways, right? But using DSRP, using other very concrete tools that three, four, 10 years from now, hopefully, that our students would have as a common point of reference, a lens, and they understood that words matter. They understood those distinctions. It wasn't this just idea that everything is connected. And then moreover, as I said, that it was not just for engineers, that the idea behind systems thinking, systems design, design thinking, uh, and, and I have the slide up now, that it is for folks that are going to be speech writers, for folks that are going to be acquisition experts, lawyers. My boss, the dean here, is a lawyer. He has sat through systems classes. I guess he has to because he's the big boss. but. In terms of what is relevant and applicable, 
Second is about five years ago, Derek, and I don't know that we've talked about this, the army itself as a big, massive 1.2 million person operation that includes both the reserve component, the guard and the active force, uh, about 300,000 active. As part of its teaching of, of army officers, teaches uh, operational design and systems thinking at the army level. Now, yeah. unfortunately, it comes 10 years into being army officers, and they think it's way too late. Yeah, uh, they, they ridiculously have a course. It's a 20-year course, right? Well, if you've been in the Army 20 years and someone is introducing system thinking to you, you either have been doing it by happy accident or you don't do it and you're not going to do it because we all know that one of our mental models is that whatever worked for us is probably the little horse we're going to ride. So I don't know if that answered your question, Derek. Uh, but but as as an example, right, you know, I, you know, I had some case studies should the folks that are still uh, enduring to the very end here uh, on both NASA Homeland Security, and I talked about the Iron Man suit, but um, I don't know if folks have other questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer or maybe clarify, because I know this has been a little more monologue than I had hoped. Right. Um, so there's one question, which is, uh, they mentioned a bunch of things, uh, scout versus soldier mindsets, SOF truths, uh, effects-based operations, centers of gravity, SOSA, uh, all lived in the military. Can you speak to why the, why the military seems to be, can be, I guess, more linear and mechanistic in their thinking, even when faced with complexity and things like that. Yeah, no, no, I, I actually think that's a correct characterization, right? Uh, I have served at the military at the sort of, sort of off on the sidelines where we're sort of the think tank, hoping to induce good ideas in cadets. Uh, I've actually served in operational units. Uh, I, I think the military itself is not monolithic. I think we have some innovative, um, you know, in some of those examples, for example, our special operations communities are better trained, they're smaller, they're more agile, they're less likely to stick to something because that's how it worked 10 years ago. And we hire people from a talent management perspective that are willing to embrace the things that make you a better systems thinker. Now, before I sound like a poster child for my soon to be former employer of 34 years, mm -hmm. we have a ton of linear thinkers. And I don't mean that in a good way. I mean that, uh, you know, and I don't want to in any way make this sound um, uh, overly uh, violent. But, it, you know, there are doctrinal ways that we learn things and we prepare for uh, combat operations. And I was fond of saying I'm not interested in dying doctrinally, that if the steps are one to 12 to capture a hill, and I say that euphemistically, we have more complicated things we're doing. Uh, the problem is to train mass formations and to educate them and to get them to understand that you have to have a baseline. You know, there's a way to, you know, set up a hammock. There's a way to build a canoe. There's a way to climb a hill. There's a way, Derek, to climb a mountain and glacier and do all the cool stuff you've done. The, the problem becomes if you can't get beyond the baseline and you can't get yourself smarter, you can't I always hire people that are ton smarter than me that will help me get past my own barriers to learning. I, I, I mentioned it, we are all, I'm gonna make a claim. Everyone on this call is super successful, right? Or you wouldn't be on this call. You, you care about learning, you care about teaching, you care about applying ideas. Um, at some point we have blind spots and the systems thinking that, that we teach that we are inculcating in cadets isn't always present in the army. Uh, and that's why I think it's so important and valuable. I, I would argue it's also not present in government. It's also not present in many industries. Now, industry has the advantage that, you know, they have faster cycle times and maybe they're more inclined to innovate. But I have an admiration for business, not ever having done anything but deliver newspapers, so I could be wrong. Yeah. Any other questions? I apologize. I can't see. Uh, no, that's okay. Chat questions. I, I, I'll, I'll. I'm picking them out and uh, 
I'll give them to you. Um, can you talk a little bit about some, the way uh, our courses and topics fit up? Because originally the the headline was how do we teach systems thinking and how is it foundational? These yeah. are the things we think are important. So I'm listening to your questions. I'm just um, um, gratuitously still throwing up some more slides. Yeah. Yeah. So like there's a question about do, do, do you teach the cadets system dynamics, for example? And I think do. it falls underneath this idea that system dynamics can be a powerful tool but if they're not systems thinkers then you if you're if you're kind of a linear thinker and you use system dynamics you're not going to use it in a very systemy way so the tool doesn't make you a systems person well the good news is you're going to fail the course yeah, right <laughs> having taught it right so john sturm and nelson were petting those cats over at uh, mit i graduated from that program uh I, I think that if you use that as a tool and you use systems thinking as a deeper understanding of the tool, I 100% I agree with you, Derek, and it's not just because you've taught me this, right? But I, I think that um, if, and I, here's the proof in the pudding, right? A lot of our best cadets go off and in, in, uh, their work is exemplary. Those that can make that extra leap where it's clear that there's a cognitive difference and not a mechanistic view of how they do research, how they serve clients, are able to use those systems models, are able to show those interconnections and in systems dynamic modeling. We do a lot of modeling and simulation here, but it doesn't work, as you said. It's, it's, it's the cliche, you know, your inputs certainly impact your outputs. Understanding the right question will lead to a better solution. And, and I would say, uh, and I'm gonna jump here, right? So this is why we think it matters. For instance, our system decision-making process, right? One of the very first things in our, our method of decision-making, you know, very much tied to mental models is how do you define the problem? Right. If you're not a systems thinker, you're screwed because you haven't even figured out, you know, what you're doing, where you're doing it and how you're doing it. So anything that comes after that is wasted. You can't design a solution for something you haven't properly scoped and scaled. You can if you want to. I know we're close on time, if yeah. not over in four minutes. No, we're good. Um, trying to think, read through this. Can I tell a funny story while you're reading? What? Straight from the uh, ICU in Austin, Texas, where apparently, you know, Austin is not an easy city to die in. They will not let you die, right? <laughs> uh, I happened to collapse in front of a police officer to an EMS vehicle. That doctor, when he walked in, he he looked like Yoda. He was super smart and uh, just super knowledgeable. But I thought it was super interesting to note that first or second night in the ICU, I was barely in and out of consciousness, that the degree of obnoxious of alarm in all the various tubes and equipment sticking out of my head and other places is not correlated to its severity. <laughs> the little CPAP machine that's only job was to keep me breathing, that thing sounded like a freight train when it was uh, out of water. The little thing that actually monitored that I was dying, right, because I did uh, stop breathing one night, that was like, bing, bing. Like, I'm obviously sure they were connected somewhere else. But if those people were better systems designers, and I tried to tell them this, and of course, they ignore me because they're like, dude, I just work here. <laughs> but the problem with this little magic kit that you have is it impacts like I, none of you go through the drive through like normal people, right? Because you're pissed off that there's like 10 better ways to like serve you a bad hamburger. You're pissed off that like, there are efficient, effective, smarter ways to do things. So this is the only problem that even in ICU, when your brain is only a quarter working, that you realize there's just so many better ways to do things. Go ahead, Derek. That well, was that is humor. That's my like my whole life experience is like waiting, watching why it is that it takes so long to get a cup of coffee and like yeah. redesigning their whole system in my right. and you do it for free, but the problem is Derek, nobody believes us. Yeah, exactly. You have one more question, friend. Yeah, well, I just I I'll never forget the story uh, where where we were down there and um, we're talking to the cadets, uh, the systems engineering cadets, and of course there's competition between the different types of systems engineers. 
or yes. engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, structural engineers, et cetera, and, and the systems engineers. And the systems engineers were saying from your department, they were saying the projects we like the most are the ones where we all get together and work as a team because in that environment, the systems engineer rises to the top, right? Because right. they're able to understand the whole picture, the part of the EE, the electrical, part of the mechanical, part of the structural, part of the, all these things, but then also have the big picture view. And so they were begging for essentially the ability to compete because, um, because that's where they shine. And that happens in real life as well, out in the real world. Um, so I, I think that this, this you know, the speaker before you, John, Lacey, John Lacey said, you know, it's like a superpower. And I think even in the engineering context, it is a superpower. I agree with you, Derek. And I think that, uh, so Lisa Shea is my West Point classmate. She graduated two in the class of 1,100. I was not two, in, I was not one, <laughs> remotely in single digits. But Lisa was the deputy of electrical engineering, and she would often comment that the market, right, uh, would always uh, allow the systems engineer kids to shine. She had no reason to say that. I mean, she was just like a good umpire. Oh, by the way, I'm wearing my Army baseball because we're headed to the Patriot League championship um, and, and hopefully on to the NCAA regionals and tourney. Um, the the system like a good umpire would always uh reward uh systems cadets injury management cadets and decision science cadets and, and the example that i always use is uh, it isn't that those electrical engineers weren't brilliant and, and maybe brilliant er I and mean, that's not good grammar but my brain doesn't work um but they didn't have the context you know i used to say hey snowden what are you working on man like you're already coding it's like day two of our semester long project and you're coding. What are you doing? We have yet to like figure out if it's a vegetable, mineral, like what are we doing, right? And and even interestingly, we all bring our biases. So here I am a colonel, but ever, there's like three other colonels on this team. Like, hey, Rich, you know, don't beat up our electrical engineer. I said, I won't, just keep him away from me because he's dangerous. <laughs> so I, I just think that there is, uh, you know, maybe some of this is just we are, um, you know, in the self-admiration society in the systems world. But uh, going even further, Derek, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll wrap this way because I, I know I had 30 minutes and, and I'm a little bit over. Um, I don't think I ever should, and, and I worked for two administrations. Uh, I don't think I ever, uh, you know, didn't take the chance to say to people uh, at the highest levels of government and the, and the national leadership, uh, you know, what is what are we trying to do? What is the top level sort of systems view. And it got, after a year working with around me, I, I certainly work for them. You know, I get the little snip from, uh, you know, either the president or senior leader. It's like, okay, Rich, what's the systems view, right? Okay, I take the little jab, but I would hope that the federal government has a systems view, just like I hope Army baseball has a systems view. NASA sure as heck had a systems view. Uh, because you can't spend that much money, bring together that many complex systems and not integrate them without a deeper understanding of what is the purpose, what are we trying to do. And DSRP is not too small to be applied to the biggest problem. So I see both Cabreras there. That's probably my hook. I'm very... <laughs> Happy that my brain didn't melt doing this. Uh, I hope I didn't make you uncomfortable telling you about professor and patient, no, no. but there's no way I was going to not do this talk because I'm very grateful to the Cabreras. And I'm actually uh, unsurprisingly very grateful to the communities that uh, shape this discipline uh, because as a, you know, mediocre scholar, I spent a lot of time running around you know, get shot at. Uh, I love uh, what a college campus brings. I love what this community of people that take time, all of you, and I can see all your names, James Bond, very impressive. Uh, I can see that you care. And that for me, uh, it certainly isn't money. I did the Army for 34 years. I'm pretty sure that other organizations pay a little bit better. 
But I just wanted to end that way by saying that, you know, whether we talked about cadets or curriculum or, um, you know, whatever it is, I was hoping to paint a picture for you, uh, the tools that you use every day and the, the ways that you employ them. We try very hard here to instill in our nation's leaders. Uh, and again, I don't want like patriotic music to go in the background. We have plenty of flaws and plenty of gaps and you don't have to buy into any of my military stuff. It'll be a little tough sell at Brown. But the point is the content is uh, super important and context matters. I believe that these things we're discussing transcend context and work in at the Peace Corps and they work in the War Corps. Thank you. Rich, thank you so much. It was great having you and we are all rooting for your full and total recovery and all that. So um, thank you for being here. You definitely didn't have to be given all the things you've gone through. Remember to give our love to Christy and Matt. Yes. Thank you very much. And we I will, friends. Thank you very, very much. I will meet myself. Okay. And, and can't look forward to seeing you all. Okay. Yes, soon. You too soon.